Hey everybody. Uh, hey, there's a TV program called Top Gear. Uh, three British guys uh, who um, test out and try out different uh, vehicles all the time trying to figure out which one is better. So they'll get three pickup trucks or three family vans or um, or three really, really fast and expensive sports cars. And they'll test all of them, all of which is to find out which one is better. And it's not necessarily the one that's less expensive. It's not necessarily the one that gets better gas mileage. It's always around performance or beauty or something like that, that what it comes down to to make that vehicle win the prize of being better than the others that they tested out. So uh, we've been doing that. Uh, we've been studying... Uh, the book of Hebrews, and seeing that, um, for example, Jesus is um, a better Savior than the angels, better than Moses, better than Joshua, better than the priest, better than even the high priest, and that's been everything leading up to this point. Last week we teased out the name Melchizedek as uh, a high priest that Jesus is fashioned or built or designed, or um, or comes along after the order thereof. Well, okay, I'm Pete Woodward, and we're continuing our study of uh, the book of Hebrews. It's really a uh, sermon. We don't know the author, and uh, it's a uh, it's a portrayal of uh, understanding the Old Testament uh, in a deeper and richer way so that we can understand what God is doing through Jesus Christ in this final uh, revelation of the Savior of the world. I, uh, I bring up uh, better for a couple of reasons. You know one already. Uh, but the author to, uh, to the Hebrews, this writer, uh, actually shows us a better way to... Uh, study the scriptures. Um, our lesson points out that uh, the um, Jewish interpreters from long ago, as they would look at the Old Testament, tried to bring their own uh, assumptions or preconceived ideas about what the Old Testament was trying to say. And so they designed in their minds that Melchizedek was perhaps Shem, the uh, son of Noah, or perhaps he was some chief or priest king of the Canaanite uh, nations, perhaps the Jebusites, all to um, guide their own interpretation that Old Testament scripture exalts the institution of Judaism, and that's all it does. The author to the Hebrews is different. He has a better model, in my opinion, uh, on how to read and interpret the Old Testament. Now, he has an assumption. His assumption is that the Old Testament is there to show us, to teach us about uh, Jesus, uh, because he's a believer in Jesus. So people bring assumptions, but then you have to look at the text and discover whether or not it really supports your assumptions, rather than forcing the text to prove your assumptions. You let the text speak and bring out whatever um, interpretation that it's going to have. And so the writer to the Hebrews looks at the Old Testament and asks, how does it testify to Jesus? And he knows the Old Testament is the Word of God, but he won't allow it to teach anything that obscures the glory of Christ Jesus nor will he fill in any gaps of what the Old Testament does not say in order to satisfy curiosity or give a reasonable reconstruction. So uh, that's what's going to happen uh, in our lesson today, in our lecture uh, of this uh, session four. We're going to talk about Melchizedek. And the lesson... Um, lecture is so well written 
that uh, while I usually don't read these lectures today, it's just so well done that I'm going to read to you. So here goes. <laughs> uh, the author of the Hebrews in previous chapters has just declared Jesus to be a priest, in fact, the high priest. But on what authority? Well, the Old Testament priests were descendants of Aaron, and Jesus was not uh, a descendant of Aaron. He's a, he's a descendant of the tribe of Judah. Uh, but Jesus was a high priest according to a different category or a different order. According to Psalm 110, he's priest according to the order, the likeness, the category of Melchizedek. And again, who is Melchizedek? Well, we have to look at the only other passage from which we can learn about Melchizedek, and that's chapter 14 of Genesis. I'm sure our lesson has unpacked that for you in spades. Abram, who later was renamed Abraham by God to signify that he would become the father of many nations, he was a wealthy and powerful master of a large clan. He was not permanently settled in a city, but lived in Palestine as a semi-nomadic sojourner. In an intentional conflict, excuse me, an international conflict that erupted in that area, the uh, city of Sodom was one of the losers, and Abram's nephew, Lot, a resident of Sodom, was taken captive. Well, Abram pursued the abductors, rescued Lot, and brought back the goods that belonged to the king of Sodom. Well, Genesis 14, 18 to 20, says that just as Abram met the king of Sodom to return his people and his property, Scripture tells us this. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, and he was priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hands. And then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. In other words, he worshipped by giving him um, a gift, uh, tithing to him. That's all it says. There's no preparation, no follow-up. Melchizedek is historically puzzling as a figure of whom the Old Testament doesn't speak again until the words of Psalm 110, verse 4, where the Lord says, to the Messiah, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. But we're able to learn everything we need to know about the significance of Melchizedek now from Hebrews 7, to which we're going to spend our time. So Melchizedek is like the Son of God in that he remains a priest forever, according to verse 3. This does not mean that Melchizedek himself serves eternally as a priest, but that his priesthood is perpetuated by Jesus. Now, if you haven't opened your Bibles yet to uh, Hebrews 7, I'm going to suggest you do that because we're going to be picking at particular verses here. Uh, with the account of Genesis 14 in view, Hebrews 7, 1 to 3, lists seven things that are stated or deduced about Melchizedek. One, he was priest of God Most High. Two, he was blessed by Abram. Three, he received a tithe from Abram. Four, his name means king of righteousness. Five, he's also king of peace, that is, Salem, or Shalom, we sometimes hear that word. Six, he's without genealogy, that is, no parent or descendants are mentioned. And seven, he has neither beginning nor end, but abides, that is, continues, because no account of his birth or his death are ever given. Now, notice that none of the requirements that would later regulate the Levitical priesthood apply to Melchizedek. No record is given of his parentage or of his descendants, something absolutely necessary, as we learned, for Levitical priests. The idea is not that Melchizedek had no father or mother, but that this information is not important in the case of Melchizedek. In his case, this information is Immaterial. Scripture ignores his origin and his descendants because they have no bearing on the validity of his priesthood, something that is not true in the Aaronic or Levitical priesthood. The same is true of Christ in regard to his priesthood. While it's important in one respect that Jesus' ancestry is given, 
in the Bible to establish his descent from David uh, as the forefather of the Messiah, his ancestry was not what qualified him for priesthood. Jesus' priesthood was not connected with his genealogy, just as Melchizedek's priesthood was not connected, connected with his genealogy. Jesus' priesthood was of a different order from that of the Levitical priesthood. His was of the order of Melchizedek, and this genealogy played no role. Melchizedek remains a priest forever, since his priesthood lives on in the priesthood of Jesus, the eternal high priest, who continues his priesthood in heaven. Melchizedek's priesthood is perpetuated in Christ. The Levitical priesthood ended with Jesus' once-for-all sacrifice of atonement, and the destruction of the temple effectively put an end to all of that kind of activity. But Melchizedek's priesthood lives on in the eternal priesthood of Jesus, the Messiah, the heavenly temple. Now the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, that is Jesus, who became man as Jesus the Messiah, was true God from all eternity. We've talked about that, two natures of Jesus, true God and true man. He's the original, of which Melchizedek is only a shadow. Melchizedek's appearance is a prophecy that points ahead to and reveals something about the priesthood of the Son of God. The historical figure Melchizedek and the way the scriptures describe him as like the Son of God, that is, as a priest who foreshadows and so reveals beforehand the kind of priest the Messiah would be, one whose priesthood would be independent of genealogy, one greater than the Levitical priests, one who remains a priest forever, and one whose priesthood is established by God's own oath. Scripture reveals that Melchizedek is a priest of a category greater than, and here we could say better than, the order of the Levitical priests. Abram paid Melchizedek a tithe and Melchizedek blessed Abram. Both acts show that Melchizedek's status is higher than that of Abram. Abram paid Melchizedek a tithe, even though there is no genealogical claim or law by which Melchizedek could demand it. Abram simply recognized Melchizedek's greater dignity as priest of God Most High. And that greater dignity is also why Melchizedek blessed Abram. It's an accepted truth that verse 7 of our text, the lesser person is blessed by the greater. Moreover, the Levitical priests, who eventually came from the lineage of Abraham, were quite simply mortal. But as scripture does not record Melchizedek's death, his priesthood continues to live on. All of the many Levitical priests who were to be born later were present, so to speak, in the genes of Abraham, Abram when that patriarch acknowledged the greater dignity of Melchizedek and paid him a tithe. So now look at verses 11 through 19 of chapter 7. The former law and its Levitical priesthood have now been replaced by a better one. There's that word. The thesis or conclusion of this paragraph is in chapter 7, verses 18 and 19, where it says, The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless, for the law made nothing perfect. And a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. Well, that's true. The law only shows us our inability to, to climb our way up to God and his good graces. No, the law was only there to <laughs> point out how desperately we need to uh, have something better, and uh, that's the hope that we have in Christ. The assertion is that the assertions in that statement are argued in three separate ways, which we're going to unpack right now. First, when Psalm 110 verse 4 says that the Messiah is a priest according to the order of Melchizedek, 
That proves the attainment of the final goal is not possible through the Levitical priesthood and through the laws that set up the Levitical priesthood and the forms of worship those priests follow and taught, for God does not duplicate his efforts. If his goal would have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, God would never have promised and spoken about another priesthood and a priest to come later. Secondly, Psalm 110 speaks of the Messiah, who is the son of David, and so of the tribe of Judah from which the Lord Jesus was, in fact, <laughs> born of the tribe of Judah. No member of that tribe ever approached the altar under the old law. So again, the prophecy of Psalm 110 shows that the Levitical law and the priesthood had to be removed and replaced with another priesthood. Third, the priesthood of the order of Melchizedek continues on, and the Messiah is priest forever. His life is indestructible. The grave did not hold him. He was raised up from the dead. All this is in contrast to the Levitical priests, who were numerous because they were mortal. They had to keep on being replaced because they died. They had to base their claim to hold their office on regulations that depended upon their ancestry, since they had to take up the unfinished work of their weak and mortal fathers, grandfathers, great-grandfathers, and ancestors. So also, on the basis of an immortal life, the priesthood according to the order of Melchizedek is greater. And here we'd say, not just better. Look at verses 20 through 28 now. As the priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, Jesus is the guarantor of a better covenant than the covenant served by the Levitical priesthood. When reading Hebrews, we should remember the special nature of the covenant God makes with us. In human relationships, a covenant means an agreement between two parties in which both have a part in working out the agreement. For example, the marriage covenant. But the covenant God makes is always completely one-sided. He alone establishes the terms. The other party is invited to only be a recipient of those terms. What a picture of grace that is. For clarity's sake, we call that a promise. Such a promise has a guarantor, someone who puts the evidence of the the, the evidence of the good faith of the promiser uh, kind of puts it out there sort of as a bondsman. He holds the thing promised and delivers it to those to whom it should go. Who he is and what he does and has is the pledge of the promise. It's all a believer has to trust in as he hopes to receive the content of that promise. So, Jesus is that guarantor, a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Jesus is better than the Levitical priests. The promise of which he is the guarantor is also, therefore, better than the promises they deliver as they carried out the arrangements for dispensing God's grace through the old covenant system of sacrifices. Jesus is just simply a better guarantor. How much better? <laughs> well, one indication of how much better lies in the fact that God swore an oath with uh, regard to the Messiah's priesthood. To quote Psalm 110, verse 4 again, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. No words so strong were used in connection with the Levitical priesthood. Also, Jesus is better because he remains alive to intercede for everyone whereas the Levitical priests died and had to be replaced. Jesus is better, too, because he's sinless and has gone on to heaven. He has no need to make sacrifice for his own sins, as the Levitical priests did. But he made one sacrifice for everyone, and then went to heaven. Finally, Jesus is better because He's not weak and susceptible to sin. But in God's own holy Son, he has completed his atoning work and is, with an oath, installed at God's right hand as priest forever. So, we see 
in chapter 5 of Hebrews things Jesus has in common with typical priests. But here in chapter 7, those elements that are unique to Jesus as he fulfills the prophecy of a better priesthood are foreshadowed by Melchizedek. Now, our author warns us, didn't he? This is meaty stuff. You know, this is moving on from the milk and really chewing on the, <coughs> the, the goody stuff, uh, the beneficial stuff of our faith. It's an understanding of the Old Testament guided by the Holy Spirit, not by human reasoning or learning, certainly not by our culture and what it says. But when we follow this line of interpretation, we begin to appreciate more and more our author's outlook and method as he encourages Jewish believers in Jesus who are hesitant to put everything on the line for the sake of the eternal salvation that's promised by Jesus. In other words, they might be saying to themselves, why should we confess Jesus and leave ourselves open to persecution? They seem to be saying, don't we have reason enough to hope in salvation based on following the Old Testament, all of that stuff we've talked about, angels and Moses and, and, uh, and, and uh, Joshua and, you know, uh, the, the priests. After all, didn't that all come from the Word of God? Yes, indeed, our author would say. And when you become skilled in the word of righteousness, you see why it's necessary to move from the covenant with which the Levitical priests were associated to a better covenant of which Jesus is the guarantor. Because of what the Old Testament itself teaches about the Levitical priesthood and the priesthood of Jesus, the Messiah, we come to the conviction that Jesus is the guarantor of a better covenant and has introduced, verse 19, a better hope through which we draw near to God. That better hope through which we are drawing near to God is also important to us. While we may not feel the tug in quite the same direction as the first readers of Hebrews did, or for quite the same reason, we also may be drawn away from our faith in Christ. The world around us presents a full range of tugs from those that appeal to our intellect to those that are plainly directed at our more baser appetites. We spoke about some of these last week. All promise a better life, but Christ is even better than anything this world can promise. It's still true today. Hang on to that. Christ is better. Now, two issues emerge from our study this week. The priesthood of Jesus and how to read the Old Testament. Sometimes neither seem very important in our minds as Christians today. Most just don't want to read the Old Testament much at all, apart from a few prophecies around Christmas time. Most concentrate more on how shall we live than on through whom shall we draw near to God. Most likely, very few people link Jesus' priesthood and how to read the Old Testament. Have we not heard someone say, all roads lead to heaven? Or point to a common use of the Old Testament as evidence that, well, you know, Jews and Christians and Muslims all worship the same God down deep. And that's replete in our culture. It is true that Jews, Christians, and Muslims all reverence the Old Testament, but as I pointed out at the beginning, they all hear far different messages and have different faiths and worship different gods. They bring different assumptions to what this word is saying. Those who don't understand the Old Testament in the light of Christ, as we have seen done powerfully in Hebrews 7, they often arrive at false notions about the validity of non-Christian faiths. When we read uh, the Bible just as literature, the Old Testament, it's exquisite, no question. When we read with reason for historical information, the Old Testament is fascinating and 
very enlightening. But when we read as divine revelation testifying to Jesus as the Christ, the Old Testament acquires a clarity as never before seen. And that's the encouragement, I think, that comes from Hebrews chapter 7. Don't just read the Old Testament to satisfy some historical curiosity, but see Christ in every page. And that's what mature students of Scripture do. Plus, mature students of the Scripture have the Holy Spirit who comes along to help them. And then, with all who have gone before us, we can claim that Jesus Christ is the one and only way to be brought to eternal salvation and communion with God, his original intent by sending a Savior. And that won't be so hard to confess all of a sudden to other people either. Both things, spirit-led and Christ-centered reading of the Old Testament and confession of Jesus, call for us to set human reason aside and to listen to the Word of God in Scripture, in both the Old Testament and in the New Testament. God bless your study. The Lord be with you.